regarding the acquisitions of a company, I want to sort of go step by step with you guys one more time and go through the process. So I want to just you know go over what's going on here uh, in about a 20 minute. Um, so the idea with this is that I wanted to go through like the five, six steps before we get to consolidation first. So before we get to consolidation, and then I wanted to work on the consolidation with you guys for some time today, before we get to the minority interest. So the question is like, say we're acquiring, we're acquiring a company. We're acquiring a company. The first thing that we want to do, the first thing that happens is that we're looking at the acquisition price, right? So we're coming in, for example, eight hundred thousand. You know, what what's our first question? What are we trying to figure out right away? I'm I'm curious because I'm trying to I want to work it out. So I have eight hundred thousand acquisition price. All right, first thing I want to know is what is the book value of the subsidiary? Right away, I'm like, what's the book value? What am I getting in terms of the book value? All right, so I'm getting here, for example, net book value, some company, 600000 So, okay, so I'm getting assets minus liabilities of this underlying company is 600000 So I'm paying eight hundred. Something is going on. Like something is happening here. There's two things that could be going on. You know, what are the two things here? You know, what's at play? One thing is its assets are actually worth more than the book. Totally understandable because every company's assets are different than their original historical price. That's one. Two, there is actually potential that even though the 800 is coming in and I'm getting book value, and I'm even paying in the fair value that's not in book value, there's just one more piece that I'm getting. And that piece is the goodwill. I'm paying more for them than, um, than, is, than in their value. Somebody was just telling me on Friday at the office that the, the Clippers, the ex CEO of Microsoft bought the LA Clippers and paid two billion. Can we work with that? Because the LA Clippers were going to sell themselves for five hundred million. So I was like, okay. It sounds like book value is probably like two hundred million or something. It sounds like fair value because that's what the price that pretty much was the market price was five hundred million. So then this guy, Mr. Bomber, Steve Bomber, comes in, ex CEO of Microsoft, like Microsoft stock. So he's got two billion. Yeah, wants two billion. You know, companies close to. I mean the Basketball team is close to Seattle, and I don't know where he lives at. So he's like, "I'll buy it." You know, I want the team. All right, so that's you know, like two billion. That's over the five hundred million was all they wanted, you know. But he's paying. Why is he paying? It's a rare asset, right? NBA teams are rare assets. You know, he he wants it. He wants it. That's it. So he's gonna pay more. So that's records as goodwill. That's the excess, 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 and that's goodwill. So in this situation, we allocate first this two hundred thousand dollar excess um, first to the actual assets that we know about, and then that's how we come up to one hundred twenty. So we're like, we well, listen, we're overpaying by two hundred. Only one hundred twenty of that is related to assets. So now we know the goodwill. So this all is going to come back in journal entry A. When we look at journal entry A, it's basically the mirror of what we were just talking about here. In a way, if you know this chart, it's one thing understanding it when you look at it, but when you start understanding the elimination process and the consolidation process, we have to go back and understand how to eliminate the investment account using these ideas here. It's another level of understanding. So what comes next after you allocate the assets and their respective fair values um, and now you have to allocate the next piece because you're like, I have an excess of fair value related to specific assets. And now I need to figure out the amortization amount. Why do I, for example, have this amortization amount? Why do I, why do I work with that? The reason is the excess amount, I'm buying these assets, I'm putting them on the consolidated balance sheet, right? But now this patent, for example, is going to disappear in 10 years. And the value is not, the excess value is not captured anywhere except for on the consolidated report. So on the consolidated report, I need to amortize this 
if I don't, my financial statements are misstated. Right? What happens year after year? I don't amortize. I don't care. I have the guy. There are a lot of things to think about. Okay, so you have a misstatement. First year, your overstated balance sheet by 13000 Income is overstated by 13000 Second year, balance sheet is overstated by 26000 Income statement is overstated by 26000 You know, what's going on? Errors, errors, piling up, piling up. Why? Listen, this is not, you're not counting. You're including the fair value of this in your balance sheet, but you're not including the fact that it's gradually moving to zero. You need to move, you need to record that. Now, where do you record that? Let's go back through the foundation. What's the environment of the consolidation business combination environment? You have your parent, sub, consolidation worksheet, consolidated numbers. So things that happen on the consolidation sheet affect only the consolidated report. They don't affect the sub or the parent. When I'm talking about amortization, I'm talking about amortization on the consolidation worksheet. Does amortization affect the subsidiary? No. Does it affect the parent just on its own books? No. It only affects when you consolidate and when you produce your final consolidated report. Everything happens in a flush. So once you know how to do that, the next thing you want to do is learn the five methods of affecting the investment account. You know, why do you want to learn the five methods of affecting the investment account? Because journal entry S and journal entry A, I, E, and D, essentially reverse engineer the original effects on the investment account. What's the goal of the consolidation as it relates to the investment account? Get it to zero. Excellent. This is the simplest way of saying it. It's like, it's like it's so simple. It's like you want to get the investment account to zero. Like you could talk about it for half an hour, right? It's like you want to just get rid of it, you know? So how do you get the investment account to zero? You want to cre keep crediting it. Keep crediting, you know, you want to credit out the book value. Like you want to credit out the excess fair value, right? You want to credit out, like, the investment income you added to it. You want to, like, you know, cr add the dividends that you subtracted from it. Anything that you did to it, you want to reverse out because there is no investment. You know, why is there no investment, guys? Yeah, because I bought, you know, I bought this company, right? I bought this company. It's not an investment. I'm just now bringing its assets and liabilities onto my book. So there is no investment. I got to, all right. So we keep the investment for internal reporting purposes. But for external reporting purposes at year end as it relates to the consolidated report, we don't keep the investment account. You know, so you just think of that clarity. For the internal report, I keep the investment account. For the consolidated report, I get rid of the investment account. So that's important as, as in terms of why are we doing some of these journal entries and who is performing what where. You know, so what are the five ways to affect the investment account just so we understand? And by the way, minority interest, which we do today and Thursday, believe it or not, surprisingly, is actually the exact same thing. So I just want to go over it one more time because minority interest is actually going to be the same exact piece just as a reflection sort of on another part of the statement. The original investment value is purchase price. It, you know, you launch with purchase price. From there on out, how do you affect it? Purchases add to it, sales subtract from it, right? Equity, um, income, and investee. If it's positive, you add to the investment. If it's negative, you subtract from the investment, right? Dividends, subtract from the investment, right? Then you have uh, amortization, the amortization of excess of fair value of assets. Subtracts if it's negative, adds if it's positive. How do you have a positive addition from an amortization? Exactly, if it's overvalued on your books, like you're buying 
um, a company that has obsolete iPhone 5s on its balance sheet. So uh, these iPhone 5s four days ago were worth three, 400 bucks a phone. Now they're worth 300 bucks a phone. So the book value, you know, was 400. Now it's 300. So you're gonna have to amortize this negative devaluation, which gives you a negative expense. Negative expenses increase income. So just be aware of that. And then the last one is could be positive or negative, and that's the reversal of unrealized deferred revenue regarding unsold inventory or the subsequent realization of sold inventory after the fact. So these are sort of the, the only transactions in a way that can affect the investment account. So now that we go into the next piece, you'll see like, oh, okay, well, those are the ones that we're going to reverse. We're going to focus on reversing just that, just these. So just want to go over these quickly with you guys before you guys start. You know, with journal entry S, what's the purpose of journal entry S? In a, in a way, in terms of eliminating, if you're going to eliminate the investment account, say this is the investment account. This is like your total, which is 800000 to begin with, for example. J Stock journal entry S Initially, its job is to eliminate the book value portion of the investment, and this is 600. So it's going to credit the book value portion of the investment, get rid of it, because we want to eliminate it. To what degree do we eliminate it? The book value of the subsidiary first. Now that's the credit, that's credit to investment, so I'm, I'm getting rid of that. What is the debit? The debit is the subsidiary's equity. In this situation, the subsidiary equity is also worth 600. No, because when you bought the subsidiary, what you paid for it was book value plus excess over book value. So in a way, if you're gonna eliminate the book value of the subsidiary, it's gonna have to equal its original equity because its equity is its assets minus liabilities. So this is, you're basically eliminating the subsidiary equity, you know, and at the same time, that causes a reduction in your investment account. To what amount? To the amount that's equivalent to the subsidiary's equity. In this situation, it's the same 600 that we saw before as their book value. So what is this piece, for example, like, that's the 200. So in a way, how do you reach your goal of eliminating the whole investment account? You credit the investment for 200. What is, the, what is that equivalent to on the debit side? 120 goes to the assets, which is what we talked about. That was 120. And 80 goes to the goodwill. Goodwill, 120 plus 80 equals 200. Yeah, the equivalent is overvalued. In a way, it's kind of like if we say the obsolete inventory. Yeah, good question, right? So that's the idea of what, we, what we're just talking about.